On today's show, I am joined by Sly Hooper's Jordan Christmas to talk about the now 3-4-5 race between the Philadelphia 76ers and the Cleveland Cavaliers with the Cats placing, playing the Sixers on Monday next week and still plenty of more games to go between both squads. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. As I said, I am Evan Damerell, but joining me today is not my co-host Chris Manning, recurring friend of the program and making his face debut uh, because video is now uh, no longer not an option on this. Uh, it's Jordan Christmas. Jordan, how you doing today, brother? I'm doing great. Uh, I figured, like I was telling you before, I figured this, I had to this, live up this to my... This week's been a bit of an emotional swing for you, but go ahead. I was saying, you know... Before, you know, we started recording, I was like, I had to live up to my friend of the pod title. And I've been on here before, but not here during the, uh, you know, the video era of the Locked on Cavs podcast. So it's good to be here. Good to show my face. And uh, yeah, it's thanks for having me. Of course. And for those who don't know, Jordan is one of the best Sixers analysts and insight provider I can ever think of. And it has been a bit of a, a bit be. of a, well, no, you do a great job and he, you should, if you guys enjoy his voice or come to enjoy his analysis, like I do check him out on YouTube at Sly Hooper. He does a lot of video essays on who has been rocking and rolling, including, um, I'm not sure if it's up yet. I can't remember, but you are cooking something up about Sam Merrill. If I do know, or unless it's already, it's already uh, on the stove and it's ready to serve. It, that video has been out. Uh, I released it last week because uh, I did a, underrated role players video and i just had to include sam merrill in it just the fact that he is attempting like i think it was 13 threes per 36 last i checked and that's just that's just absurd um given that he's playing 20 minutes a game well lately since uh the mobley garland you know both of them were out and then uh i also dropped a video a couple of days ago about how you know the Cavs saved their season basically and broke down um you know, a couple of things and JB Bickerstaff, obviously Donovan Mitchell and Jared Allen have been playing fantastic. And then, you know, the other guys like Isaac Okoro and Dean Wade taking threes, making threes, but also just providing some very great defense. They were great against the Clippers the other night also. So yeah, I cover, I cover a lot of teams try to, you know, not be too sixer based, but you know, Sometimes I can't help it. <laughs> no, it's, it's, you know, that's the beauty of fandom sometimes. But you had mentioned the Cavs have been playing well. The Sixers are on a four-game slide currently, so it does make it interesting. But Jordan, for you, like, is it just Embiid dealing with the injuries that have caused this slide? Is it Tyrese Maxey's uncertainty and unavailability? Or what is going on to Philadelphia that at least put them in the spot where you know, like you said, the start of last week when I first pitched this idea to you, they were the third seed. Cleveland was the four seed, and they had about a two game gap with each other. But now they're they're tied up with Cleveland having the one win over Philly, leapfrogging them right now for the four or five matchup. So, what is going on with the Sixers lately? I would honestly, I would say a lot of it is health based. I mean, there's been there had been an illness going through this team multiple points throughout this season. Tobias Harris just came back a few uh in the Portland game on um I think it was Sunday night. No, it was Monday night. Sorry. I was I'm getting my days mixed up cuz I've <laughs> I'm a Niner fan so I've been worried about the playoffs too. Um that's another story for another day, but um it's been mostly health and the fact that when you have four of your five starters out at any given time, like that's just, that's going to be a recipe for losing games. Obviously, the Denver game that everybody is just talking about and making up dumb narratives about, and then continuing to the Portland game. Um, and then obviously, yesterday with the Warriors, Maxi was still out. Harris was just the second game back. DeAnthony Melton is dealing with a back injury that I don't know if it's connected to last year, but he has been playing on and off with that. And then 
Tyrese Maxey. I don't know when he sprained his ankle in the Indiana game, but he's been out for now three straight games with this ankle injury. So this recent slide, I would say, is injury-based because when the Sixers have been healthy, and I've told you this before, um, and I've told other people before, like I've this is the most I've uh, believed in the Sixers team. Now, I know that sounds crazy because of their second-round woes and stuff like that, but Nick Nurse has got these guys playing well. Joel Embiid's playing with a point guard that will actually shoot a basketball. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of athletes and wings on this roster. Weird concept, I know, having athletes and wings on an NBA roster. And um, they've been playing well when healthy. Um, the starting lineup of Batum, Maxi. Harris, Melton, and Embiid have just been blowing the doors off teams, and they just haven't been healthy recently. And now with this Embiid injury, it looks like the Knicks and the Cavs have a pretty good position to duke it out for the third and the fourth seed because right now they're the fifth seed, and the favorite as of a week, a few days ago for MVP is now looking to be out probably for a bit here. Well, he... It- we can talk on it if we have the time, but I mean, I think the NBA rules instituted uh, may the favorite of the MVP uh, completely out of the race entirely, just depending on things. But for you, just in the short term, do you think Philadelphia can afford to ride this wave that, like you said, four of their five starters out is suboptimal. Cleveland has gone through it themselves, not having Darius Garland and Evan Mobley for so long, but that's two guys and they still had, um, Donovan Mitchell and Jared Allen to lean on heavily, but do you think Philly has the capacity, uh, at least under Nick Nurse, to dig deep and kind of ride this wave and maybe find proper footing with the other guys, or is do you just think like the the massive sudden injuries and just you know whether it's Maxi or Embiid lately, I think Embiid being the biggest one, or even Anthony Melton and Bias Harris still trying to find his footing again after just coming back from injury, like an illness, and it's just. Do you think the Sixers have the capacity, the gas, the tank to kind of stay afloat? Just because, like I had mentioned, um, Cleveland plays Philly on Monday. And like I, I feel like that is going to be a bit of a swing game for maybe who decides things in terms of like tiebreakers and stuff like that. Uh, short answer, no. Um, long answer, I could say that, you know, I just mentioned that this would, to me, it, and I've watched the Sixers since I was, eight years old. Um, The reason I'm a lifelong California resident who somehow became a Sixer fan was because of Allen Iverson. So I've watched this team for a bit. Um, I I think in this, during the Embiid era, this is the most fitting team that's been around him just in terms of, you know, shooters, wings, and a dynamic guard. And there's a double-edged sword to that because when the team that fits so well around your best player, when that guy is gone, it's very, it's trouble. It's, it's basically trouble because now you're asking DeAnthony Melton to create more. You're asking Tyrese Maxey, who I just have loved this season from Tyrese Maxey, the week he's you had. Were, you were vilified on that take after the James Harden trade. And I, told you privately I will eat crow on that because he has been a <laughs> stud with a capital S T U. Yes. And look, I was high on Maxi coming into the season. If Harden got traded, I did not expect this. Now he has been struggling a little bit shooting the ball lately, but at the end of the day, you're still asking a 23 year old point guard to essentially be the second best player on a championship team. And I just think, there's a lot he still needs to prove with that. And it's just tough to ask a guy so young in the toughest position with the highest learning curve in the NBA to perform to those expectations. And look, every step of Tyrese Maxey's career, he's blown expectations out of the water, whether it be from fans, media, et cetera. But you're still asking a lot of him to be the second best guy on a championship team, right? And then, you know, Tobias Harris, he could probably, you know, now that he will probably get the ball more, he can, you know, get into a rhythm more scoring the ball, going downhill and stuff like that. But when a team is fit, so one of the things that I did like about, you know, when it was the Ben Simmons era, transition to the James Harden era, is when Embiid was out, you could at least fall back, kind of like, you know, similar to the Cavs. 
you know, I honestly thought it was the season could have gotten, I mean, I've told you this, I thought the season could have potentially gotten dark for the Cavs after losing Mobley and Garland at the same time, essentially. I know Mobley was out for a few games before the Garland injury, but Mm -hmm. you have two stars to fall back on. Jared Allen's been to an all-star game. Donovan Mitchell is one of the be conservative top 20 to 25 players in the NBA. You have, you have star power to fall back on. And that was one of the benefits in the Harden and Ben Simmons era. You could at least play a little bit differently. This particular team, it's better because it's fitting around one of the best players in the world in Embiid. But when that guy is gone, you know, then they really have to tread water. And I don't know if they can do that. And especially when, you know, three and four of your starters are out at the same time. I mean, the hospital Sixers, that's kind of the name that Sixers Twitter has gone with when, uh, you know, a lot of the guys are out. But the hospital Sixers have been entertaining. They almost stole one in Denver earlier this year. They almost stole one in Boston on the road where Patrick Beverly just randomly goes off for like 26 points and like 10 assists. And then he's hitting weird jump hooks and doing the too small thing to people. But I mean, there there's a reason why they always flame out at the end, even if they keep the game close. It's just because they don't have the horses. And I don't know if I could see them maybe adjusting a few things and changing the playing style a little bit, but it's kind of a tough ask. No, I the way you laid it out, I, I kind of had that feeling, but the way you painted the picture, because since we're buddies, I, I do keep up on the Sixers just because I know that's that's how we became pals as you were covering the Sixers. And I was actually doing the Hornets at the time, then switched the Cavs. But um, shout out hashtag basketball dot com. But <laughs> we'll touch more on maybe some changes Philly can make externally, whether it's trades, uh, G League call ups, you know, waiting for health or and for the Cavs as well, just because they do play each other on Monday. I think it's going to be a bit of a litmus test with healthy and trying to get better maybe Philly gets some bodies and guys back but maybe just like as competitive as these two teams are or if they happen to collide in the playoffs like what upgrades do does either team need to either avoid this matchup or make sure it's a little bit more palatable for everyone at the start of the new year every small business owner asks themselves the same question what move can i make that'll take my business to the next level in 2024 LinkedIn Jobs knows that your success depends on the team you surround yourself with. That's why LinkedIn Jobs has created the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of over a billion professionals making it the best place to hire. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn also knows that small businesses are wearing many hats and might not have the time or resources to hire. Thankfully, with LinkedIn, the process is intuitive, quick, and easy. Post your job for free at linkedin.com forward slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash L O C K E D O N N B A to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. This episode of locked on Cavs is brought to you by better help around new years. We get obsessed with how to change ourselves instead of just expanding on what we're already doing. Right. Maybe you finally organize one part of your space and want to tackle another. Or maybe you want to take supplements every morning and want to eat breakfast on top of that too. Therapy helps you find your strengths to ditch extreme resolutions and make the changes that actually stick. I've been going to therapy for over a decade now, and it's given me a toolkit to address my general anxieties and fears so that it doesn't consume me and I can keep on going. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just complete a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Celebrate the progress you've made today. Visit BetterHelp.com forward slash locked on NBA to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H E L P.com forward slash locked on NBA. All right. As I had mentioned before, we're going to talk about trades and things like that. The trade deadline as of this episode is a handful of days away. I'm counting off it's the fifth, sixth, seventh. If you want to include this morning, it's four days away. And Jordan, in your eyes, Philly is sitting on quite a bit of assets after that James Harden trade and just kind of acquiescing yes, and moving things around and still, you know, trying to really build around Joel Embiid. But in your eyes, like even with the emergence of Tyrese Maxey, and if they somehow get the benefit of good health on their side, no team is ever perfect. 
in your eyes, like what is a realistic move for Philadelphia to make leading up to the trade deadline? Like you sent me some pretty like nasty and like the nicest way possible <laughs> trades of like getting DeJounte Murray, DeAndre Hunter and Bogdanovich from Atlanta in the same move. Um, there, were, there were some BS trades. I'll be honest. I was doing yeah. the, you know, the lopsided 2K trades that only worked oh, yeah. for me. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. But realistically speaking, um, who are some players you think the Philadelphia should go after just to make an upgrade so that or Philadelphia, or at least we'll talk about the Cavs in a bit, but at least in Philly's sake, like what can Philly do just to kind of either to right the ship and give them the horses to kind of remain competitive in a very tight three, four, five race in the East. Oh man, I've gone back and forth on what the Sixers should do because on the one hand, Daryl Morey has definitely recovered nicely getting some assets in the James Harden trade, obviously the expiring contracts, but more importantly, the unprotected Clippers pick, which is in 2028. And then you got the uh, 2026 pick. That's either it comes from like four. It'll come from one of four different teams. I'm blanking on a few of them. And then obviously some second round picks as well in a pick mm-hmm. swap, I believe. Daryl Morey recovered nicely with this James Harden trade. And I've been wondering and thinking about what he should do, because on the one hand, I get I don't think. I don't think the cap space plan that I'm sure you've read, everybody's read that Daryl Morey's, you know, his whole, you know, the Sixers can free up near upwards of $55 million in cap space this summer. That would involve renouncing everybody essentially, except for Maxi and Embiid and like two other players. Uh, Springer, I believe, is one of them. Um, but I just don't think that's a viable plan. I mean, since the Kevin Durant or maybe the Kawhi Leonard signing to the Clippers, but that had to include the fact that they had to trade for Paul George. We haven't really seen a big star sign outright with a team um, in free agency. It's come via mm. a big trade or a sign in trade or what have you. So it's like, what what's Daryl exactly planning here? And for me, this is the Embiid's playing better than ever, better score, better passer, this is probably his best defensive season of his career. Maxie's ascending. What yeah, should they do? You can't punt uh, or wait till the summer when this is it, all happening exactly. right now. You got to be dynamic, not static. Yeah, exactly. And I just think there's multiple ways to use your cap space. And for me, it's like we need another ball handler desperately because Patrick Beverly as the secondary ball handler. He's been more than what I could possibly hope for this year. But mm-hmm. you need a somebody like I've thought about DeJounte Murray and Bogdan Bogdanovich. I even settled on that. Like if you could somehow get Bogey and DeJounte Murray on this Sixers team, I think that would alleviate a lot of problems shooting, um, ball handling, especially to help out Maxi, because I think he's really feeling the effects of playing 37 minutes a game. And I know the Nick Nurse jokes will come in, but Maxi had to play so much because he is essentially the only ball handler on the team outside of Patrick Beverly. And I would count that as like half. So like we've had one and a half ball handlers essentially. And Maxie's pull up three point shooting has been down drastically this year. Cause I just think he has heavy legs so far to go to this point in the season. So you need, I w- I was leaning towards getting bogey and Murray I don't think Tyus Jones is viable because I just don't think he can hold up defensively in the playoffs. Um, I've thought about the Brooklyn Nets guys like Dorian Finney-Smith. Uh, the Nets really, if the Nets asking price is really two first round picks, I think that's insane to me. Um, but whatever. Don't do that trade, Daryl, please. Uh, but if you get one of those two wings, that could help. But I'm looking at the Sixers rotation now and it's like, it's a tough balance for Daryl to strike, but that's why he gets paid the big bucks because it's like, do you want to trade for a few role players, but are those role players actually going to get into the rotation over the top nine right now? Cause I like the top nine in the rotation when mm-hmm. everybody's healthy, or do you use the cap space and essentially tie yourself up to DeJounte Murray or bogey or you know, I know everybody's talking about marketing and Mikel Bridges. I just think those are unrealistic. The Sixers had their shot with Mikel Bridges and traded him away on draft night. So 
it's I don't know how realistic that is that uh you know they get him. I don't think it is at all. And then or do you wait until draft night where you can get another draft pick to trade because you can be able to use the the you know how you can basically go a season further into the future with your draft picks to trade away. So it's a tough balance, but I think I've settled on maybe you get Murray and Bogey from the Hawks. It'll obviously take some contracts and some picks, but who knows what Daryl will do. It, it could be something out of nowhere, but I think that's what I've landed on. I could understand going the role player out, but that's just my two cents. I would rather do the Murray Bogey thing. That's where I've landed on personally. What about Bruce Brown with the uh, Raptors? If you could give up a combination of expirings and some of those draft picks because Toronto is looking for a first for Brown and that's ball handling. Um, that's I would love Bruce up. Brown on the Sixers team. I think with, I think the problem with that is um, because he has a player option on his contract, uh, mm-hmm. his money would be a sit or his cap hold, I think would essentially and look, I'm not a cap hole. I'm not a cap space guru. So do not, put this in stone for me, but because he has a player option for net or a team option, excuse me for next, for next year, his cap hold would definitely impact Maury's cap space plan. If that really is his backup contingency plan. So that complicates things. But if you're talking about the player on in relation to being on the Sixers, I would love Bruce Brown. Yeah. Proven guy. We just saw him be one of the most important players on a championship team had some great finals games, can defend, can shoot, ball handle a little bit. And despite being 6'4", he can defend multiple positions and he can play different roles. We saw him essentially play power forward in Brooklyn. We mm-hmm. essentially saw him be a super a super sub po- uh, point guard or combo guard off the bench for the Nuggets. So I, I would love Bruce Brown, obviously. But again, it's the money that complicates the things. If it was a buyout, then absolutely, but I don't even think he, that's going to happen, you know? No. I mean, Tor- it'd be foolhardy of Toronto to buy up Bruce Brown's contract yeah. now. Be like, that's a- and if I'm Toronto, why not keep him? I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, he's a especially- good, good guy to have in the locker room, young team, so. And if he wants to be there, he'll be there. But on Cleveland's side of things, just looking at like the roster itself, they are not as flush with assets or expirings like Philly is. Like, I'm going through Philly's um, <clears throat> just – Guys, right now, it's like Robert Covington's making a healthy bit of money. So is uh, Morris Senior, who's making a healthy bit of money. Like you said, they have multiple first-round picks from the James Harden trade from the Clippers that they can acquiesce into a move. And it is the question of cap space for Philly, and also it is for the Cavs, because both teams are right up against that luxury tax apron, which can make things a lot more complicated if you want to make moves uh, yes, down the line the as well. Tax. Yeah, but for Cleveland, you mentioned Dorian Finney-Smith. If the asking price is two first-round picks or even a first-round pick, like that would give me pause just because he's having like an astronomically amazing shooting year, but like historically speaking, hasn't been like that elite of a shooter in his career. So how would he look in a different situation that's not Brooklyn's? Um, and then you look at guys, even like it's been reported by The Athletic as of when we're recording this, that even though it's kind of known that the Wizards are looking for two first rounders for Kyle Kuzma. It seems more of a case of the Wizards making it publicly known that they want more than, but they're expecting maybe less than that. So like a first rounder in that return. And maybe if you're Cleveland, you consider that just because your 2030 draft pick is, could be available via swaps and stuff to entice a team doing that. But it's I'm just not hard. trading multiple multiple picks for Kuzma. As no. much as I think he's actually been underrated just because he's on a clown Wizards team, what he did on that Lakers championship run, I actually I hold weight to that, So, but I'm not trading multiple oh, no, picks I, for I, that guy. Oh, no, I agree. And it's just in Cleveland's sake, like, looking at the financial optics right now, like, it's tricky. Like, And you had talked about the Cavs, like, everyone's playing really well without Mobley and Garland out there, and... They were recording this before the Cavs play the Pistons uh, on Wednesday for t- for reference. But um, is Garland, Garland coming back tonight? Sorry, it's it's the expectation for him that he's coming back tonight. And so, Mobley like, looked you, good on Monday. I thought, yeah, in was it Monday? Minutes. Yeah, yeah, it was Monday yeah. against the Clippers. He had limited like twenty ish minutes or so, but yeah, almost had a double double. Like was played as advertised defensively, showed a little bit of pop offensively. Um, but 
for Cleveland, it's just hard because like you have so many guys, like when you consider moving Karis Levert, even though he's your sixth man and he's really gelled in that role for Cleveland as like the third guard in the rotation between Garland mm-hmm. and Mitchell and just like off the bench as the, the lead guard and giving opportunities to cook and score. Um, do you want to entertain trading Isaac Okoro, who's playing out of his mind, but he is going to be an RFA this summer and you may not be able to afford to keep him because of the luxury tax stuff. No, like, and the thing is, is like, you don't have the assets because you emptied the clip to go get Donovan Mitchell last summer. Yeah. So yep. you're kind of looking at it where like the Cavs have thrived with, let's just be frank, 10 or 11 viable players because Ricky Rubio has been gone. Damian Jones just hasn't been it. Ty Jerome hasn't played since the home opening loss to the Oklahoma City Thunder and he just had ankle surgery so he's out for the foreseeable future. Tristan if, Thompson got suspended. Yeah, Tristan Thompson being it makes sense why yeah. uh, he looked like he was in his 20s again. <laughs> I, I was like he came back and I was like man he's looking like 2016 finals Tristan Thompson. He was, was sometimes he'd switch on the perimeter and I'm just like what is that what? <laughs> this looked like 2016. Weird, <laughs> exactly and like after that, it's like George Niang, maybe, but like he's a bit of a locker room guy for them. Is kind of like the conduit, and like he's been playing very well. Oh too. yeah, not surprising. And he's also just like because he's not gun shy, as you had like told me, he's going to shoot the heck out of the ball, and he's done exactly that. Like every time he gets a look on the perimeter, he'll do it. And then you have those no, 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 yes moments where he'll drive to the basket, and he sometimes gets fouled and sometimes converts, or it's just an ugly turnover, or have a nice they, dump off pass yeah, to Jared Allen yeah, yeah, in that Clippers that, game. Yep, yep, and so. If there's stuff like that where you're thinking, do we want to compromise what is working right now and the chemistry in this locker room, which is always fragile, and like maybe pull a guy out to bring a different face in? Like it's a hard conversation you have to have if you're the Cavs, but I just don't see them making like a splashy, splashy move. Or if like me, probably calling up Brooklyn again to see if Royce O'Neal is available for some matching salary in a second or two and like Brooklyn just moves off of that like I think he has money down the line as well and I think that's a move that at least gets you another f- seat at the table in the Donovan N- Mitchell negotiations because Royce is like his best friend from their time together in Utah and the Cavs have certainly brought in a lot of his close friends from Utah including George and Yang recently and like it's yep. just an interesting situation but other than that, like I agree with you. Like the two, the two first round picks is already kind of unrealistic to me for most teams for Dorian Finney Smith. I feel like that is a little bit of organizational malpractice if you gave that much up for Dorian Finney Smith. But <laughs> yeah, also I don't run an NBA team for a reason. But um, if you're Cleveland, like it's got to be like a bigger like you. The Sixers need some ball handling support. I think every team just needs athletes or guys on the wing and. The unfortunate thing is that's what Cleveland needs. Is like they need that guy that can play the three or the four. Is not afraid to shoot the basketball and can play good to passable defense, especially on the perimeter. But the problem is those guys are a premium commodity in basketball and the teams that have them that are available, they're going to ask a lot for them. Like, like you said, if Bruce Brown was realistically available for Cleveland, like I'd love that fit as like that guy who could play three or four, but also be like another ball handler just because it wouldn't hurt to have that option just in the event. Like, you want to give Darius Garland a little bit more rest or you want to give Donovan Mitchell a little bit more breathing space just, and then the offense doesn't completely fall apart if either of them or both of them are sitting and like, yeah, Levert can do it, but you need some secondary support there too. But unless you're Ronnie from Baltimore, happy Super Bowl season to all who celebrate from FanDuel America's number one sports book. If you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch, grabbing your favorite football snacks and figuring out the intricacies of a comedy podcast logistics, leading to Taylor Swift going from Tokyo to Las Vegas. And also most of all, placing some super bets. FanDuel has so many ways for you to end the season with a W, or two, or three. Not only can you bet on who will win Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. New customers can join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets in if you place a first bet of $5 or more and it wins. Just visit FanDuel.com forward slash locked on to sign up. That's FanDuel.com forward slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel the official sportsbook partner of the NFL and the official sportsbook of the Locked On Podcast Network. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Um, Wouldn't you look at um, Mobley and Garland as basically your acquisitions, considering how well you guys had played without him? I know it was a soft schedule, but I hate that argument a lot of the time because it's like you can only play the teams in front of you. 
Yeah. And also they beat Milwaukee and they beat the Clippers. So, I mean, but I would look at Mobley and Garland as like your acquisitions. And last year they yeah. that double big and then obviously the Garland Mitchell backcourt. That was a pretty good lineup just net rating wise, um yeah. offensive rating wise, defensive rating wise last year was it didn't the, the number doesn't look as good, but I mean in practice, defensively, it works. And yeah. I just it, the the thing about this run is I feel like for the Cavs, that run they've been on, this gives them the ability to play multiple ways now. Cause we have to give credit to JB Bickerstaff. Just the culture, first of all, to withstand losing your two best players. And JB has I know he has been a <laughs> I'm sure your as your mentions can attest to for the last year and a half, JB has been a lightning rod topic for uh you know the Cav- yeah. Cavs fan out Cavs fans out there but JB has one installed culture two changed how they've played i think before december 14th um and my numbers aren't as recent they don't take these two last two games into account because i would did my video before december 14th i think the Cavs were like bottom in the league in three point attempts they were like 27th or something and yeah, then it's after- skyrocketed Afterwards, they're third in makes and uh, in attempts and makes. It's pretty wild how they've adjusted. I'm pulling out my notebook here so I can get my stats right. <laughs> um, but the way that he's adjusted, JB deserves all the credit in the world for what, like, that's coaching right there. Culture, yeah. first of all, managing a locker room, losing your two best players, despite there were 13 and 12. It could have easily gone the other way after losing Mobley and Garland. But mm-hmm. now they now you can kind of look at this and be like, we're on this run. We're getting our one, two of our best players back. And that could be your trade acquisitions. I agree with you. I think that's a, a good way to put it for sure. Um, just like that's your deadline acquisition just because you're getting that infusion of talent and the team is already playing so well that it is like a new acquisition in that sense where you're trying to acclimate these guys to what has been working in. Yeah, the, the, the three-point barrage the Cavs have gone on was something they were certainly doing a ton of in the preseason. Like, they were not gun-shy whatsoever. I've been talking to people who may be tuning in for the first time. They're like, it's fascinating to see um, just, like, how well Max Struess has adapted and thrived in this role and did it for oh, George Niang. Oh, he's like, all year. And, like, Sam Merrill, too, has been, like, a revelation just because they just run similar offensive sets and rotations that they do for Struess. And they also, you know, Merrill studies Struess's game extensively. So I think there's just a lot of the sameness that you have out there just in terms of unafraid, like perimeter shooting and scoring, but just like contextualizing this and crystallizing it for this game between the Sixers and the Cavs coming up, or even in a possible playoff series, like how would you feel it would go between like both teams, assuming both sides are fully healthy? Because I the Cavs were not fully healthy because um, Craig Porter Jr. was playing in overtime last time Cleveland played Philly on that abomination of a court. But um, <laughs> it was an interesting game for me. And I feel like if these two teams met in the playoffs, it would be a series that goes the distance. And But I don't know who would win in a best of seven. Like It could be chalk at that point, just depending on how things go. And maybe a non um performance enhancing drug uh tristan thompson (laughs) ends up being the difference maker for Cavs. but i'm just curious on your thoughts of like these two two teams end up meeting um in the postseason like how do you think it would go well obviously i am biased because i am a sixer fan but i do think this would be a coin flip series it's not you know especially with this run the Cavs have been on and the players that have been uncovered, you know, in, mm-hmm. introduced into the rotation, like Sam Merrill, Craig Porter Jr., he's been playing pretty consistently the last 20 or so games. Cause I know earlier in the year, like he showed flashes, like there was that national TV game against the Knicks where I was like, this guy was undrafted. Like, and yeah. then he played really well in that Sixers game. And then he got a few DMP CDs there. And it was kind of like, why isn't Craig Porter Jr. playing? Like he, Short of, sort of showed that he should be in the rotation. Um, so it'll be, I think it'd be an interesting series. I think for me, I just lean towards as much as I have respect for Evan Mobley and Jared Allen as defensive players. I just don't think there's few players in the league that can guard Joel Embiid, like a 40 year old Al Horford, apparently. 
and uh, though he had been playing better against him the last few regular seasons, but the playoffs absolutely a question mark. But Brook Lopez also, Marcus All, who just announced his uh, retirement today, actually or this morning. Um, but mm-hmm. um, I just don't think they have the horses to guard and bead. And I, it's funny every time the Sixers play the Cavs, and you know I follow you know you and a few other Cavs people and. They they just, they just go nuts about the the fouls that Embiid draws. Not to say that he doesn't grift. You know, I'm yeah. fully aware he does, even though it's like four to five I, times a game. But I call him a free throw merchant to you. So <laughs> it's honestly a funny. It's honestly a funny like joke nickname. Just the image of a free throw merchant. But mm-hmm. but um, I just I think the for me. The Sixers, I mentioned, they have a bunch of wings that I think they can at least not stop Mo, um, Garland and Mitchell, but at least, you know, give them different looks, different coverages and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Also, as much as I gave J.B. Bickerstaff credit as a coach, I truly think the Sixers supremely upgraded at the coaching spot going from Doc Rivers to Nick Nurse. Now, Nick Nurse definitely has some faults. But the thing I've liked about Nick Nurse this year is that he'll just try different things. He'll do a box and one. He'll do all these types of zones. He'll mix. He's willing to mix up one on one matchups and, you know, allow Embiid to roam off and play free safety. And like I mentioned, Embiid has this is the best defensive season of Embiid's career. And that includes a season where he finished fourth in defensive player of the year voting. I think it was the 2017 18 season. And so that's just the differentiator for me. And I know if Cavs fans listen to this podcast, they're going to roll their eyes and be like, of course, you know, you're picking the Sixers. But I just have to roll with the best player in that series and the guy who was the MVP favorite. And also, I do like, even though Garland and Mitchell will definitely give it to Tyrese Maxey on the defensive end, they're probably going to hunt him hard right Mm -hmm. but i do think that maxi can give it to them on the other end too because the combination of his pull-up shooting his downhill speed i think he's one of the five fastest players in the nba uh De'Aaron fox being the cream of the crop here in sacramento that's where i live um Mm -hmm. and then i just think the sixers have multiple wings they can throw to mix up defensive coverages and stuff like that i truly do think I'm not sitting here and telling you the Cavs don't have a chance against the Sixers. I can very easily see the Cavs beating the Sixers, especially if they stand pat at the trade deadline. But of course, a lot of this is mute because we just don't know how severe Embiid's injury is. But I think the two main things for me is I do think we would have the coaching advantage and we would have the best player in that series. So... I, yeah. I could definitely see it going six or seven, but, mm-hmm. you know, just from an upgrade standpoint, having Embiid, having Nurse, I do think the Sixers would have the edge. Yeah, I think they would have the edge, too, just from the Embiid aspect, even though Jared Allen's been playing out of his mind and Tristan Thompson did once say and Embiid confirmed that the, the E still runs through Cleveland. But <laughs> I, I know for the fans' sake... um. If they're already high sodium consumers to begin with, this uh, game, these series will definitely cause them to have a heart attack, no matter what, because of the pure free throws. And I think, like, even on the cab side of things, like, there are Knights Donovan Mitchell or Darius Garland can get to the line quite a bit too, but maybe it's not to the level of Embiid, and Embiid kind of has that stink associated with him from playing with Harden because Harden just makes it worse. But oh, yeah, Harden made it worse last year. First, I'm not denying that. (laughs) But I think this is a series where I'd say it goes chalk because like you said, you can make a pretty solid argument for both teams. Like in Cleveland's case, I think if Mobley is fully healthy and he told me before the Pistons game a shoot around, like he's never was concerned about his knee. And for him, like he knew he was back back when he converted on that alley-oop dunk from Donovan Mitchell. And he's like, yeah, I'm fine. I feel physically fine. I just had to get back in in game shape. And, it's the same for Garland, and obviously, like, you know, knock on wood that injuries don't happen between now and then, but for Cleveland, like, Allen could... I, I don't think you can slow down Embiid, but I think the Sixers have the pressure points elsewhere. The Cavs can maybe exploit some of those matchups, and as you noted, like, Philly can go bigger. They can play with a lot more wings to kind of just 
turn turn up the pressure on um Mitchell and Garland and cut off the head of the the proverbial snake on offense to kind of slow Cleveland down. Um, Nick Nurse is a huge upgrade comparatively to Doc Rivers and J.B. Bickerstaff's track record in the postseason still isn't great. He has only won three games in three postseason series overall, so he is three and nine as a coach in the playoffs? Or no? Sorry. um, Three and 12, excuse me, in the playoffs. But either way, like the Cavs, I feel like this this series would be toxic for the fan bases without a doubt, but <laughs> it could be a grind. And if you're the other team sitting at the top, whether it's Milwaukee or Boston, or if this somehow holds and things just don't, if like the playoffs started today and it's Cavs, Sixers is the toss up and New York ends up being third. Like even if you're in New York, like, yeah. or They've the, been on it, a tear, it, dude. Yeah, but like. <laughs> <laughs> They're yeah, they have been, and it felt like those two were on a collision path to like meet each other in the playoffs again, like the Cavs and the Knicks. But if it ends up not being that case, like if you're one of the other teams in the top three, and it's a four or five match between Philly and Cleveland, you're watching these two teams just bludgeon each other to death, and it goes six or seven. Like you're happy with this outcome if you're an opposing team, and I think if the Cavs stand pat and don't make um any serious moves at the deadline and they're very satisfied. And like you said, getting Mobley and Garland back is like their big move as they hack and them to the roster. And Philly just kind of gets the fortune and luxury of good health and maybe another ball handler. Like if both teams just work within the margins and kind of keep like this projected path that they're on now with Philly's case, just getting healthy and maybe making moves on the margins too, just to upgrade elsewhere. Like I could see a realistic path of these two teams clash. And unfortunately it, this game on Monday won't really be able to give us any indication of how a series could go just because the the, the Sixers could be without MB. They could be without Maxi. Maybe another injury pops up for Cleveland. Like Jared Allen is <clears throat> questionable against the Pistons as we're recording this because of a sudden illness. I know it's Devin Mobley had the sniffles beforehand, so he might be out with an illness too. Like it's hitting everyone right now, as you had noted before, like earlier in the show, Jordan, but it, it'll be, it's just tough for me because like, I want to know <laughs> how right. these two teams would look fully healthy because it gives me perspective when I'm like sitting down to like <clears throat> piece together how a series would go for the team I cover and it helps when you have footage and film to figure it out and like that makes add some of the mystery and intrigue but like I, I just want to know how these teams stack up against each other because the Cavs want to prove that they belong in that conversation with like Philly, Milwaukee, and Boston and it certainly takes away the shine of it if like let's say Cleveland wins and they're the, the Sixers are out without Maxi and Embiid, and it's just like mm, it's not as uh not as big as or impressive as a win as it might have. Yeah, I mean, hard regular season series, you could take a few, I guess, you could take a few things away from you know regular season series, but it's an eighty-two game season. Mm-hmm. Guys are going to be in and out and all that. Um, one X factor I did forget to mention. Um, I have liked the Sixers bench this year, but the Cavs bench, especially during this stretch, has been absolutely incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, I was looking at their numbers, you know, when I was doing my video on them um, before and after December fourteenth, and they were like anywhere from 24th to 27th in all the categories, points per game, assists per game, three-point shooting. And then Mm -hmm. since then, they doubled their three-point makes, have doubled their three-point attempts, and they're basically first, third, first, seventh, and they're third in points per game, seventh in assist, first in three-point makes, first in three-point attempts, third in three-point percentage. Like, their bench has been playing really well. And I am interested to see how JB, you know, kind of reconfigures the rotation when Garland mm-hmm. and Mobley come back. Um, I know they've staggered Mobley and Jared Allen. Um, I'd imagine they're going to do more of that. It's easier to do it like they did on Monday because Mobley's on a minutes restriction. You kind of have Mobley essentially be the other five when Jared comes out, ex- vice versa, right? And then... Mm-hmm. Um, it, uh, so I'm interested to see what JB does when, you know... Garland comes back and how everything just kind of reconfigures itself because now he has a few lineups to fall back on like that Mitchell Strew, Socorro, Dean Wade and Allen lineup. Those numbers are ridiculous. I'm sure you've looked Mm -hmm. at them, but cleaning the glass like 
They have a 124 offensive rating, a 105.4 defensive rating. They're they're plus 19.5 just net rating wise, and it's like, and it makes sense. Dean Wade and Isaac Okoro have been playing great defense. Donovan Mitchell, even though he's shooting like 34 percent during this stretch, his pull up shooting is like defenses just don't. Three-point percentage doesn't matter with Donovan Mitchell. Defenses are going to defend. They're going to absolutely respect his pull-up three-point uh, mm-hmm. three game, right? And they're going to extend their defense. Jared Allen has been used as a hub of sorts um, at the elbow and the top of the key and hitting cutters. Now that since Mobley had been out, a lot of that was repurposed to Jared Allen. Um, I did a video last year on how the Cavs were kind of leaning more into Evan Mobley as a hub, and they were doing it mm-hmm. a bit this year, too. Um, him and Struess in particular, I thought, had a really good um, you know, two-man game going with each other. Um, and when Mobley went down, Allen kind of stepped into that role. So I think this run has showed that the Cavs can kind of adapt in a lot of ways. Um, there's a lot of players that have played well that I hope stay in the rotation and JV now can have some stuff in his back pocket. So I do think that is another X factor. I do want to, you know, throw out there for consideration in a potential series uh, Mm -hmm. with the Sixers. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Um, It'll be interesting to see how things evolve and how things transgress. Maybe one of these two teams makes a move or the matchup even as we record this on Wednesday. There's a lot of time between now when the Cavs and the Sixers first fit next face each other and even after and that. And now my two... mental health rests on an Embiid MRI. <laughs> yeah, and there's still two matchups after the fact, health or not, like the Sixers could be a lot healthier next time the Cavs play Cleveland and yep. vice versa. We'll, we'll see what happens. But Jordan, really appreciate your time, buddy. Uh, do you have any pluggles before we head out? I know you'd mentioned the Sam Merrill Footnote or mention shout out you gave in one of your more recent videos and you talked about the Cavs are just like primed and ready to go go. But uh, what else? Is there anything else you want to shout out or plug as we head out of here? Well, as you can see in the little header below, that's my uh, Twitter at it's Jordan underscore Xmas. You guys can also subscribe to the Sly Hooper YouTube channel. It's like Sly Cooper, but you take out the C and put in the H. Um, I do player breakdowns team breakdowns i riff on stuff i react to nba news um i need to get more back into it but i also do like other basketball related stuff like one of my most watched videos was you know the anime slam dunk versus the anime kuroko no basket and which was the better anime and i do i do stuff like i just do offhand stuff like that anything basketball related so Check the channel out. Subscribe if you're so inclined. And yeah, yeah, I'm dropping videos multiple days every week. I need to put a set schedule in. But <laughs> yep, we're we're working out here, rocking and rolling. Oh, but give yeah, give me to three. Give me to three. Give me to three thousand subscribers. <laughs> hey, no. If you're listening to us for the first time, subscribe. To, first, subscribe to Sly Hooper, and then come subscribe to Locked On Cavs. But yes. we'll definitely have you back, Jordan. Especially if the Cavs do end up playing the Sixers in the playoffs or whenever they play each other next. But thank you again for coming on, and thank you everyone for listening to today's episode of Locked On Cavs. Chris and I'll be back later this week to talk more about what is going on with the team and also the ramp up to the trade deadline. But until then, I'm Evan. That's Jordan. This is Locked On Cavs.